about to be asked next week to do a lecture series here at the university called Masterminds, and uh, that gave me the opportunity to really sit down and think about what I could say in a short period of time. My students know I'm not very good at saying things in a short period of time. Usually they take a lot longer with them, but in this setting, uh, that's why you have the Masterminds there, and the short talk, big idea, it really was a set of, I hope, big ideas behind uh, my effort to create this Drug Enforcement and Policy Center and get the funding for it. And uh, I'd love to have a chance to talk about all the different things that we're going to be doing as part of the center. We actually already have four conferences planned for just the next few months, and so um, real excited to talk about a range of the particulars of what the center is going to be up to. But I wanted to talk about kind of what's behind, pull back the curtain a little bit, my own thinking about these issues that I think is a big idea. It might be a frustrating big idea because it doesn't have a big answer at the end. But it starts uh, with maybe also a frustrating big idea, namely that humans always have, and I think we always will, use drugs. You go back in history, you can look at the Sumerians using opioids, 5000 BC, uh, Chinese emperor, though there's some debate about the historical record here, recommending marijuana for over 100 ailments in early Chinese medicine. Go back to, to South America, you see the cocoa plant being used in a variety of ways. There's no collection of human endeavors that haven't involved some drug use to some extent. I say that in part because I know you're all drug users. How do I know that? I see some of it around here. There's some caffeine on the table. I used drugs this morning. I took my cholesterol medication. I washed it down with some caffeine. I've been known to have a beer or two now and again. And there's a couple reasons I bring up that kind of drug use. One is to highlight that there are good drugs and bad drugs. And it's important to think about, when we think about drug policy and drug enforcement, uh, both the good drugs and the bad drugs. And a big part of that good drug, I think a part that especially in get to the marijuana conversation in a minute or two, uh, is the reality that for an awful lot of people, drug use is not only a harmless part of their lives, it's an incredibly important and significant, for some people, life-saving aspect of their lives. And so a world without drugs, though talked about in those terms at times, just say no, I think actually is an important part of any healthy, balanced conversation over a range of drugs, but I don't think we'd want a society without drugs. I think we want a society without the bad drugs. And so one of the things that I start to think about then, when I think about how drugs are a part of how we live our lives, the good drugs, what defines, what are the elements of what makes for the good drugs? And what I come to realize over time, what I think about a lot in this setting, is it's often an interesting combination of good government and good marketplaces, right? Governments playing an important role in fostering safety, information, making sure your Advil is Advil, <laughs> making sure you know how many to take, making sure dosages are right, making sure there's research supported on a range of things, not just things that the market would support, but things that maybe the market wouldn't pursue without some prodding by a good government. Good markets, also very important, right? fostering accessibility, choice in the marketplace, hopefully innovation that the market helps drive in ways the governments may not. A healthy partnership between governments and markets seem to be often integral to the good drug story. But unfortunately, as we have some historical examples of, markets and governments can dysfunction in very dangerous ways. I don't know if you can see this. This is something that People, when they think about the alcohol story, the history of alcohol, they often think of bad government, too much government, alcohol prohibition, that noble experiment that failed. But what's often underappreciated is a market gone wild uh, was the foundation for the temperance movement, right? And you can see this sort of picture. Beneficial to young and old, and I'm speculating she's about five years old and she's <laughs> raising a beer with Grandpa, and uh, I can just say that perhaps, you know, Grandpa, my Grandpa would want to raise a beer with me when I was five, but I'm not sure that would have been the healthiest message of the time, but that's what Rainier Beer was marketing. Of course, I trust you all, you know, recognize Joe Campbell, the notorious figure uh, used for the tobacco industry to market dangerous cigarettes, and again, I think a story in the alcohol setting of government asleep at the switch and then overreacting, right? Blanket prohibition becoming now 
government and the harms of a black market flowing from that. Nicotine being the government not really getting up to speed on the dangers and warning a consumer base about the risks that tobacco created and addiction. Uh, and then the opiate story is one that literally we could have five or six days to talk about the way in which governments and markets, again, now in this setting, and this is what I think is so interesting, much more nuanced, the story of you know, the marketplace working with government in some ways to help push pain as the fifth vital sign, as something that needs to be addressed, and then Purdue Pharma and other pharmaceutical companies working really effectively at getting doctors to use their prescription drugs in a range of settings that may not have been really medically indicated. And then a government clampdown, a government clampdown on the pill mills, a government clampdown still ongoing and trying to reduce uh, overprescribing of opiates, but that leading to what's often described as the iron law of prohibition. When you limit a drug, you oftentimes, for those who are addicted and others inclined to go into the space, lead to the development on the black market of more smaller, more potent versions of the drug, and that's the heroin, fentanyl, carfentanil story that you may have become familiar with and the dangers that we have now with the opiate epidemic. So then we turn, what are the lessons for marijuana? And among the reasons why I find this story so compelling and so interesting is we're now in the midst of an incredible, and I think really unprecedented, state-level revolution on this topic, right? States are now responding in a variety of ways to the perception that we've had too much government, too much blanket prohibition. We need to do different. And I think what's most interesting here often gets lost in a lot of conversations about marijuana reform because everybody's running to this group, the nine states, Colorado, the front runner, California, now the big player, that have gone for full recreational marijuana. And missing what I think is in many respects the more interesting and important, and of course is, is an Ohio story right now, the 30 states that have gone for the medical marijuana reform model so far. And to me, the medical model especially gets us back to that idea of, of the good drug. Right, that that's states, I think, saying, and trying to find that balance right out of the gate. How can we not allow the harmful uses of this drug, what might be the recreational uses, certainly brain development science suggests uh, that kids using this drug you know, without regulation and dosage being careful can really do some damage. How can we not foster and move in that direction uh, while still allowing for a more beneficial drug, one that can reduce pain, one that might be a useful alternative to opioids, other uh, drugs. The recreational story is really interesting for me is because I think there might be some thickness to the idea that giving people a choice of their intoxicant just on a recreational realm, alternatives to alcohol, alternatives to other kinds of <laughs> drugs that people, remember I said humans will always use drugs, might be inclined to move towards. And that's why I encourage, even though we see the conversation at the state level, hey, we're concerned about the harms and the costs of law enforcement. We're concerned about the black markets that are fostered in a world of prohibition. We're concerned about, I think, what lawyers especially should be thinking about, the disrespect for government when our laws are out of tune with what people experience and believe are important. And then the indirect harms, the limits on research, the lost taxes, jobs, the economics uh, of prohibition. That's, I think, justifiable concerns in the move away from blanket prohibition, but for me, this fundamental concern about ensuring and enhancing healthy, or at least not harmful uses, is so important, and it especially leads me, and there are some other academics working in this space that's also concerned here, let's not get too excited about replacing the government with now a commercialization, an industry that's going to give us not just healthy opportunities to use a different drug, but are going to be eager to not only provide choice, but provide less than complete information, because that's what we have right now, about what the short and long-term effects might be of using a particular drug. Uh, we need so much more research. There are so many questions about what are safe and effective medical uses, and what could be the side effects of different versions of marijuana, a range of different product, products that are available there, smoked, inhaled, vaporization, edible, you may have a little bit of a sense that the picture is meant to give you a flavor for all the different ways in which marijuana is getting packaged by commercial en entities. I mentioned this idea of substitution versus supplementation. One of the things that I think people don't fully appreciate because the conversation isn't that sophisticated that long. Marijuana use alone isn't that harmful. Marijuana use in conjunction with other drugs. 
very harmful, including alcohol. Same goes with alcohol, of course, <coughs> the same basic story. And so that, of course, gets us to the societal question, what's the impact on crime, public health, working, going to school, parenting, families, and I have my favorite, not very satisfying, nuanced words at the end, balance, flexibility, review especially. Right? To me, one of the many things that we're missing already as policy change is outpacing the research is a failure for our laws to build in the kind of review and reflection that I think is so essential in such a fast, dynamic field. The best, for example, I have here in Ohio, we have a medical marijuana advisory board that was set up for the first five years to help get the initial regulation for medical marijuana in place, and then it goes away. That's what should stay in place. I'm eager to make other things perhaps go away in a regulatory structure, but that review board, that review board that's going to be there to assess not just to help create the initial set of rules, but then assess how they're going and be in a position to make recommendations going forward. That's what I think is so essential for effective policy. That's why I'm so excited to have this new center, because that's what we're going to be studying and trying to kind of engineer, to try to move forward on uh, that message, that idea that uh, we can and should seek to move marijuana, if we can, from one of those bad drugs into those good drugs, but it's going to take an awful lot of work, an awful lot of time, an awful lot of energy, an awful lot of thoughtful people being sensitive to, <coughs> at least my perspective, that there's no extreme perspective on this that's always right. There's no obvious way that this story ought to play out, but we need to be prepared to confront it in all of its particulars. <coughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'd be interested in your view on the fact that, for example, med medical marijuana is legal in Ohio, but illegal federally. And as I look at that, any doctor who would advise you to use medical marijuana and who has a, a license from the DEA to write prescriptions is putting his or her career on the line in doing so. So there's a wonderful backstory here. That was exactly what happened when California was the pioneer with medical marijuana. A Ninth Circuit decision said doctors have a First Amendment right to give advice to patients. And so that's why, actually, it's, a you know, again, a little quirk that only lawyers understand. If a state wants to kill its own medical marijuana program, it requires doctors to give prescriptions. Louisiana, interestingly, did this. And they're like, oh, we passed the medical marijuana law. Go away, activists. Leave us alone. And, but they threw in the bullet of it has to be a prescription. And every doctor said, I'm not giving prescriptions. Every state really trying to do medical marijuana, like Ohio, does it in terms of recommendations. Now, there's an extra nuance and layer to your sophisticated question, though. Modern states like Ohio, the newer states, have required doctors to register and go through a class to say that they're essentially educated so they can make a recommendation that would be valid under the law. The Ninth Circuit opinion very much is based on the idea of it's just a doctor telling their patient what they're thinking, not that it was part of this elaborate <laughs> regulatory scheme. So there actually is, if the feds wanted to challenge some of these newer states with their more elaborate regulations where they require doctors to go through programming to even be eligible to be part of the program, the good news, I guess, is if you want the program to be successful is nobody's talking about that and everybody believes, myself included, that if Attorney General Sessions or others in the federal Justice Department want to crack down, they're not going to start with doctors. But it is a reason why many states have had troubles getting doctors to be willing to participate in their program. It's often not the we're worried about getting prosecuted as much as um, we've been told by our insurance industry that they want a little bit more in a premium if we're going to be involved in this kind of business and things like that. And then here's where you guys can particularly appreciate this if you work in regulated industries. You end up then getting, in a very dangerous way, I think, a set of doctors who are more risk takers, right? More rebel type doctors. Oh, I'll take, I'll do all the medical marijuana prescriptions and I'm actually in touch with the administrative law judge in Massachusetts who keeps getting complaints about the doctor who has 4,000 patients all of whom are getting medical marijuana <laughs> recommendations from him, but the doctor's actually sympathetic, the, 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 the judge is sympathetic to the doctor, because the doctor says, yeah, I would only give a regular number, but every single person who, my doctor friends, gets a patient that comes in and says, I want a recommendation, they send them to me. 
And so I get stuck being kind of the only one taking the hit. I'm not doing anything illegitimate. I'm just dealing with what I think is appropriate under the circumstances. And these are, again, <coughs> kinds of interesting legal regulatory questions that are coming up more and more as more and more states get further along the administration of these programs. Mayor? So, I mean, I'm, you, you talked about the center as something that you want to engage in a practical way in actually in government and in the regulated industry and, you know, commentating on a practical level. So how, how do you do that, though? Because I, so often I see that sort of stumble. You know, you've got the law school and you've got the academic structure. How do you get that? into the practical area where it makes a difference? It's a great question. I, I, one is we are going to be doing a range of projects, both, so a couple things that we have in the works. We have a conference, actually this is a more harm reduction, opiate-oriented conference that's going to be taking place here in September where we're actively trying to get uh, a range of government officials involved. I'm working with the local uh, reporter who is convinced he's going to get both of the gubernatorial candidates to come and guilt them into, hey, we're talking about opiates in Ohio in September. Mayor is the one to tell you if <laughs> that'll work. Yeah, and so, <laughs> so that, that's the aspiration in terms of just having the conversations the center generates is always going to be inviting sort of all of those players. But then also I think we're looking at producing products, deliverables, that are very focused on government audiences, right? And so two other pieces of that. There's a conference this uh, August. It's the National Association of Sentencing Commissioners, and so it's every sentencing <coughs> commission around the country coming here, and our own Ohio Sentencing Commission is, is sort of the lead sponsor. And we put together a panel that's about how can state sentencing commissions and law schools and other academic institutions work together collaboratively, because I think it's exactly the point you're making, that you know it's hard to cross over those silos and get people talking past each other. The other project we have in the works is working with a fellow who is uh, part of a public health program in uh, Massachusetts. And Massachusetts is a good spot because they are putting online their recreational marijuana regime, specifically about how can criminal justice reform be fundamental to marijuana reform. One of the things that I've written, one recent article about this, you see all these activists say, there are all these problems with the war on drugs, and that's why we should get rid of marijuana reform. But then marijuana reform comes in, and everyone's now, let me get a license and sell my product, and they forget about the energy that was behind the reform sphere for at least certain sets of voters. And so we're actually going to be trying to put together a set of deliverables that's very much focused on here's what should be integral to your state, whether it's a medical marijuana state or a recreational marijuana state, to make sure that criminal justice reform spirit isn't just a talking point for the campaign trail, but actually is something that gets delivered in law. The very tangible version of that is the expungement of past marijuana convictions, right, where there's uh, been, interestingly, very little of that work, even in the full recreational states. Colorado hasn't passed any new laws. Uh, California, usefully, was had that built into their initiative, that there would be the expungement, or at least the possibility for expungement. But then you get the next level question. OK, it's on the books. People can get their convictions expunged, but if there's a fee, or if they don't know about it, or they're concerned, oh, that's not going to do me any good, they don't go and get it effectuated anyway. And so there's both the changing the laws and monitoring whether the law, as you're trying to change it, is having an effect. So I appreciate it. I'm eager for your input for help on making sure we are effective. We've got time for one more question. One of the things that concerns me is when marijuana is either becoming legalized for recreational or just medical purposes, is that unlike alcohol, where there have been standards that you can tell when someone is, is impaired, you can tell when someone has used marijuana for a very long period of time. To my knowledge, there aren't any good standards of impairment. And that is one of the things <coughs> I think that needs to be established first so that we can tell whether we can regulate how it's used. You're, you're absolutely right that you know we have, and this is one of the real interesting things when you see so many advocates for reform say, let's treat marijuana like alcohol. And that's a nice talking point, and certainly that's a nice let's get rid of prohibition, you know, refrain to echo history. But you can't treat marijuana like alcohol. You just can't. It's a different kind of drug that affects our systems differently. One of the parts of that story, which is real interesting, it's again part of what maybe you see in the literature. Uh, probably from a public health perspective, over time, 
having people smoke marijuana rather than inject means is, is unhealthier over time because of combustion and smoking. But in terms of the one time that they're using it, smoking's better because it gives the user the effect more quickly and the likelihood that they'll overdose in some form, the likelihood that they'll become impaired unexpectedly later down the line, right? You know, people eat edibles and then they think they're fine two hours later when it's just getting metabolized into their system. And so not only is it a story of we don't even have really good science on what impairment's like because it impacts different individuals a bunch of different ways, tolerance builds up a bunch of different ways when it comes to marijuana. We don't even have good science on different ingestion methods and whether and how those are safer or more dangerous short and long term. And I agree wholeheartedly, we need a lot more science on this. You know, the one that, actually I think it was CBS this morning was talking about, you know, the driving piece of that is a huge one, right? We all know, okay, the legal limit is 0.08 with alcohol. We all should know that that's about three or four drinks. And we then kind of appreciate and modulate our activity that way. We have nothing comparable to that with respect to marijuana and we need to, or I'm inclined to say, let's get those self-driving cars going and we can at least make <laughs> that problem get diminished, you know, more quickly. That, but uh, big data will tell us that's terrible. Yeah, that's a great segue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you all. And please follow up with us.